I don't know that it's entirely what I would like to see so much as I'm trying to just identify what is likely to happen. Okay. So I'm not trying to paint some utopian picture and saying this is what we should do. But 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 I think when we see what's going to happen, we we have a position and then we perhaps fight for it. So right. for example, <clears throat> if if we were to see what would be to happen and 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 think that would be a, a net negative for everyone, we would fight against that. Mm-hmm. Like I I am a ardent supporter of democracy because I believe despite its flaws, it's the best we have. Because everywhere else in the world that doesn't have democracy is, again, arguable, <laughs> but arguably worse. Mm-hmm. I would rather be living in the UK than in Russia. Right. Uh, some people say they'd rather live in Saudi Arabia than the UK. <laughs> I understand that. Yeah. But uh, I would rather be living where we are now. And if, if I felt like we were going to trend towards a full breakdown of democracy in the UK, and I thought, feel that that would be a worse outcome, I would fight to strengthen democracy. So that I know what I want. And I would push towards that. So, again, with a caveat that this is not what I would like to see the world do, I'm trying to make an honest, objective assessment about where I think it could go okay. based on what I've studied. I'm not here to should people. Like, you should do this, you should do that. Other than, I think, freedom. I guess I do should about freedom. Life, liberty, property. I think that's a should. We should but, but, well, let's do that. Let's, let's get, actually, let's well, do that. Let me, so let's talk about this. Democracy. Okay. The book, Democracy, the God That Felled by Hoppe. Yep. I don't know if you've read it read yet. It. You, introduction in chapter one. So he lays out all the shortcomings of democracy. I think the world, as a result of Bitcoin emerging, would move back towards a model more like that. And when you say monarchy, you're like, what are you talking about? That's a regression. It sounds terrible. I encourage people, just go read introduction in chapter one to this book, where you have smaller economic enclaves and local monopolists on violence that preserve private property rights, physical private property rights, for a fee, right? Well, but sorry, what's the closest we have to that? Would you say Saudi Arabia is essentially a monarchy? I don't think we have anything like that in the world today because it's all fiat. Where is fiat not in the world today? Where is sound money? Uh, even if Saudi Arabia had fiat, sound money, they also have a monopoly on the resources to accumulate wealth. But people don't have the veto power that Bitcoin gives them over their government. And that's the point I'm getting to is, so in this world where you go, f- and this is the sovereign individual thesis. Yeah, but hold on, hold on, hold on. Having, having sovereignty over your money does not mean there aren't individuals who can monopolize the accumulation of wealth and, and as such then uh, oppress groups. It does prevent the monopolization of the accumulation of wealth to a large extent, I think. How? Because if because you, because you try you you would be trading Bitcoin for for goods and services. And if you have a monopoly over the natural resources of a large territory, you can monopolize the accumulation of wealth. Yeah. And so with wealth they, comes power. If they can't if an individual can't make money in a certain regime and they have access to Bitcoin, they leave the regime. They go somewhere where they can make money. But, but So it puts a check on government, right? That's a reduction to the tax base for Saudi Arabia. So all of a sudden they have an incentive to start treating their citizens better. But hold on. Did they even have it? Did they even have tax in Saudi Arabia? I don't know. I'll have a look. I know certainly people go to Dubai because it's tax free. I'm pretty sure. Because, uh, because, they, because they accumulate so much wealth from the natural resources. No, no income tax. Yeah, no income tax. So again, I'm not talking about anything in fiat world today. Okay. I'm talking about a world where Bitcoin is money. Yeah. Right. All other property rights would need to be enforced by some physical provider. I think that results in much smaller scale and scope of government. Government shrinks tremendously. Um, violence as a whole actually would be less of a thing you need to insure against for all the reasons we've talked about. It still exists, right? They can still come and take your house and car and all that. But I think it becomes a localized protection service versus this 330 million person nation state we have today and it's all about customer optionality in the end right if you have the ability to convert your wealth into something and go elsewhere and it's a it's an option that no one can suspend or stop then that forces you to deal with your customers more honestly like this is the nature of free market capitalism right this is what competition is competition is this discovery process like what do people want let me give it to them at a price at a competitive price 
And competition keeps you honest. If some other intern can come into the market and introduce a service better, faster, or cheaper than you, then you're out of business. But the problem with government, it's been this paradox that we need to outsource the integrity of our property rights to something that has to be preserved. But then that very institution preys on the property rights it's charged to preserve to fund itself. I mean, it's, it doesn't work, right? And we've seen, you, you know it empirically looking across history, no state ever works. It either gets conquered or it fails. Why? Why can't we figure out a sustainable way to organize ourselves? My, my, the thing is, and this is hard to talk about because we live in it. It's everywhere. Fiat statism is ubiquitous. It's all around us. Uh -huh. What I'm talking about is something hypothetical, right? It's something I think we can evolve towards. And that's the vision I guess I'm trying to lay out. It's like a non-coercive global society. I, I, you, you will still have coercion. Less society. coercive. When I say non-coercive, I'm speaking idealistically. I don't think coercion completely goes away, but you tweak the incentives, you create, you tweak the outcomes. I just, I just don't think you escape the concentrations of wealth and with the concentrations of wealth comes concentrations of power and, and those people will continue to coerce to accumulate more wealth and more power. I think you've completely, I think one of the things is you miss out the, the human component of so greed and violence. Use this imaginary construction, which is something that Mises uses a lot in human action. Okay. Imaginary world, everyone's invulnerable and you can't steal from each other. What would we do to increase wealth in that world? You can't hurt me, you can't steal my stuff. Um, you would, you would uh, invent things and build things and trade. Exactly. So if we reduce the attack surface on you being able to hurt me or you being able to steal my stuff, which you being able to hurt me is typically incentivized by you being able to steal my stuff because hurting someone's a very risky, expensive endeavor, whether it's done individually or at scale in warfare, yeah. then you shift us closer towards that world where we just make stuff, add value, and trade. True. You shift us towards that. But what is, an, uh, it, 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 I mean, we're gonna go around a circle, so I'll avoid this too much. We still don't know what the net impact, and, and, and we can't visualize what that society looks like. We don't know what it does for the vulnerable in society. We know we're way wealthier. If you increase aggregate wealth, then you've benefited the poor in society. That's, that's not necessarily true. Absolutely true. If you increase aggregate wealth, we have more capital stocks, we have better health care, we have more food, we have more infrastructure. So who, who, I we mean, can satisfy human wants more cheaply. Okay, so you would say the the U.S. has was it's been the greatest economic story. It, pre Fed, pre Fed, pre Fed. Okay, uh, it's still been a great economic story since, if you purely measure on GDP. But in terms of the health system, it's a fucking car crash. Yeah, and now I know lots of different ways you can break that down. But but the trick is like we're it's so hard to talk about because yeah. we're living inside of it, right? This is the old what is the fish and water analogy where two fish swim by each other and it's like, hey, how's the water, boys? And he looks over at the other fish. What the hell is water? Yeah, like we're swimming in it, so we can't even. It's hard to you need to step out of it to think about it. And but I we're, think, we're also living through the bust, and therefore people are pissed off and they want to like they want to find something to blame and criticize. Yeah. But we, why are people pissed off? I mean, range of range of reasons. The world's pretty fucked up right now. One main reason: rampant property right violations via I, inflation and otherwise. I think if you asked a hundred people that question, maybe one would say that. I'm not saying they cognitively understand it. Hmm. There's like a procedural knowing, like you can know you're getting fucked and feel anxiety about a situation without knowing cognitively, being able to describe propositionally what it is, and that's what I'm saying. It's like coercion and property right violations embedded in our socioeconomic reality are fucking us up from the inside out. And that's what I hope to work against and paint a vision of a better world away from. That's, um, this, by the way, this is fucking great. Like I love I to agree. work through these things because yeah. uh, I, I, I think there's a lot of group think that exists right now. I mm -hmm. think there's group think uh, around statism and I think there's a group think around uh, uh, Bitcoin, and I think people see opinion leaders, and they hear them say something, and they're like, "Oh fuck, well, I believe in that." Uh, I've discovered Bitcoin. Oh, now I'm now I'm going to be a carnivore, or now I'm, now I'm Christian. Like, there's a yes. lot of group thing that happens, and I think the most important thing is to always challenge it, to fully understand it, uh -huh. right? 
And when I challenge you, it's not to defend my position, it's to understand yours more. And I think I, a lot of people yeah. miss that. And that it's, it's, it's the reason. And I'm trying to understand my own more too. Yeah. Because I don't, again, I'm not preaching gospel here. I'm just. It's why, it's why I've come, like, come off Twitter. It's because group think, I think, is, is, is another thing that's corrosive. Yeah, and I think there's a relationship there. Maybe I'm just uh, myopic on some of this. But again, if you increase scarcity in the world, people are going to regress towards their tribalist roots, right? You, uh -huh. you want to go back towards baser level human instincts versus if you're creating more wealth and abundance in the world, they're just you, you become more autonomous. You don't need the security of the group as much. So again, if we talked about humanity like emerging in all these communist little enclaves, and then we eventually got to democracy, and now we're looking at something that's potentially post-statism, uh, coercion minimized, not coercion free. Um, hmm. That is something I think that's very beautiful to work towards. Mm -hmm.